Um, we are at risk of just isolating ourselves and our partners will look at us and say, what on earth is going on in the UK? Why are they behaving like this? And why are they laying down these strange rules by which the government seems to be trying to control how the convention is being interpreted? That is going to do our soft power no good at all. Welcome to this month's Political Sandbox by Chamber, focused on the proposed government reforms of the British Bill of Rights. My name is Aubrey Allegretti, political correspondent for The Guardian, and we're going to be talking about a controversial piece of legislation being pioneered by the Justice Secretary, Dominic Raab. It was initially unveiled by Boris Johnson's administration, dropped by Liz Truss's, but has been resurrected by Rishi Sunak. It was an attempt to deliver on the 2019 Conservative Manifesto promise of updating the Human Rights Act. However, experts have warned that it could undermine the UK's status as a legal centre and cause friction with the European Convention on Human Rights. To discuss this issue, I'm joined by two excellent experts, Robert Buckland, who is an MP and KC, and the former Attorney General, Dominic Grieve. Thank you both very much for joining me. Thank you. I'd like to start by asking you how you interpret what the British Bill of Rights in its current form looks like, what it seeks to achieve, and who it's going to impact. And Robert, if we could start with you first. Well, thank you, Aubrey. The first thing to say is that what has emerged is dramatically different from the proposals that I'd envisaged when I was Lord Chancellor before Dominic Raab. In fact, the work that I'd started in uh, pursuance of that manifesto commitment that you correctly quoted was uh, undertaken by former appeal court judge Sir Peter Gross and an expert uh, review panel of academics and from right across the British Isles and they produced a, a weight report uh, at the end of 2021 which recommended some changes to the Human Rights Act but which was then almost ignored by the current Lord Chancellor, uh, who then came forward with, frankly, completely uh, surprising and new raft of proposals entitled the Bill of Rights, which in effect um, replaced the entire Human Rights Act, get rid of it, uh, and, and replace it with uh, something called a Bill of Rights, which on one level doesn't seem to do very much at all other than replace with the same uh, content, namely the Convention of Human Rights and the provisions under it, but which I think secondly could cause uh, confusion at best and actually real legal problems at worst. Uh, and why that's important, I think, to the public is that at a time when we should be focusing on the cost of living, on the war in Ukraine, on international economic pressures, here's the government bringing forward a huge bill with a wide scope which will take up hundreds of hours of parliamentary time, which is not a manifesto commitment, uh, and which I think um, at best either does very little, if anything, to change the law on things like deportation and uh, lawfare, uh, and at worst will create real legal confusion, most notably by actually encouraging and spreading uh, the notion of rights which has always been a tension when it comes to the common law tradition, certainly in England and Wales, and indeed the, 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 the way in which um, our legal systems in Scotland and Northern Ireland won as well. And there is a massive UK devolution dimension to all of this, most notably in Northern Ireland, where interference with the Human Rights Act is causing real concern about the efficacy of the Good Friday Belfast, Good Friday Belfast Agreement. So lots of issues here, not just for lawyers, but for all of us to be very concerned about. And Dominic, what do you see the scope of this Bill of Rights being? How do you think it will affect people and what are the sort of intended changes? I find the Bill of Rights rather incomprehensible. I know that there's been a long history of concern about the way the Human Rights Act has worked, but actually this is a bit ancient history. Um, it all dates from a period when uh, 
the countries that were signatories were expanding into countries in East of Europe, which were tyrannies. And the Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg started a degree of micromanagement of the way rights were applied. And that had a knock-on effect on other particularly Western European countries with a much more established legal tradition. And there was a, a sense of irritation at the way in which the law was being developed. But this all dates back to 2005-10. Then there was the work which Ken Clark and I did, which led to the Brighton Declaration in 2012. And if you actually look at what's happening, I think I'm right in saying that in the last 12 months, calendar months, there have only been two adverse decisions of the European Court of Human Rights against the United Kingdom. And both, quite frankly, are on matters, well, one, they're legitimate, and two, they are, I wouldn't call them trivial, but they're not likely to cause serious concern to government. So why are we suddenly deciding that we must do something which was first being talked about in 2009-10 when the circumstances have changed. Now, what is it actually going to do? It has a number of consequences, it seems to me. One, it's going to make it much harder for the United Kingdom courts to apply the accepted jurisprudence, the legal decision making that has built up over time by the Court of Human Rights and our own domestic courts to the Human Rights Act and the ECA, the convention rights themselves. That's going to mean that there's going to be a disconnect. And actually, it will lead to more cases ending up in Strasbourg than do at the moment. The potential of more adverse decisions are taking place and all for very little result. Now, some of the um, aim is, I think, to go for issues which are of particular concern uh, to the public. Uh, deportation of criminals at the end at the end of their sentences and the right to a pri to a private and family life and people arguing they should be allowed to stay here, the deportation of illegal immigrants. But I have to say, I don't think it's going to make any difference because, in fact, there are problems with all these matters, which the individual cases are just a drop in the ocean compared to some of the wider problems, for example, about deporting people at the end of their sentences to countries which won't necessarily take them back. Or for that matter, getting rid of illegal immigrants where you don't know where they've come from and their country won't uh, have them returned. So we're taking a sledgehammer to the architecture, which I think was quite well crafted of the Human Rights Act and making it more cumbersome. Another example, is that at the moment, the courts are invited to try to read existing statutes compatibly with the convention. But they're being told that they shouldn't do this in future. So there will be more declarations of incompatibility. So you're going to end up with a queue of cases of, 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 of statutes waiting to be altered in the House of Commons when I can't really see why this should be needed. And indeed, one of the curious things in this bill is an extraordinary power to be taken by the Justice Secretary to decide uh, in the case of um, uh, previous declarations of incompatibility, uh, whether or not uh, the, the, how the law should be read in future. I mean, all this is, is just a burden. And as Robert has rightly pointed out, uh, this bill is going to be a monster to take through Parliament. It's going to be capable of being amended by all sorts of people who want to make use of it to introduce socioeconomic rights, uh, to allow a right for abortion. Uh, all of this is going to be massively controversial and I think is going to contribute nothing to the smooth running of a piece of legislation that I actually think has stood the test of time rather well. Thank you very much. I want to sort of look at three aspects of this First of all, the policy, then the perhaps wider politics of why the government is pursuing this, and then what we think this might do to the sort of UK's international reputation. But starting with the first, and if we can start with you, Robert, what do you think these proposed reforms will do to change the relationship between the UK Parliament and the courts? Well, I think that a lot of what Dominic said has huge force because in recent years, there has been definitely a change in the uh, way in which the court at Strasbourg and domestic courts have understood each other and respected each other's roles. 
Uh, and the evidence as to clash and as to infringement is really, really thin. You know, a couple of cases in the last year, Britain is probably, I think, one of the top, uh, you know, countries in the Council of Europe in terms of the, uh, you know, the, the, the fewest cases before the court. We are, we are by no means, you know, uh, at all in a position now where there is serious uh, friction with the court at Strasbourg. And that's been not just as a result of you know, changes in the way that the court operates, but by active judicial dialogue between senior judges here in the UK and the judges in Strasbourg. So that is a greater understanding of what is called the margin of appreciation. I think this is what is often misunderstood even by commentators. This court is nothing like the European, the Court of Justice of the EU in in Luxembourg, which of course has a duty to, 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 to safeguard and to interpret the provisions of EU law that have been brought before it. It's a very different court at Strasbourg, which uh, looks at things in a different way, frankly, and does afford member states, I think, an appreciable margin uh, in which to take uh, action domestically. But here's the thing. One of the big bugbears that uh, concerns not just judges here at home and, and politicians here in the UK, but in other member states, is the what I refer to as lawfare, you know, the, 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 the jurisdiction of the convention into theatres of war or conflict in other parts of the world. And we saw it most notably in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. There is legitimate concern about whether the convention should apply in those areas. We've got international humanitarian law, you know, the Geneva Convention to, 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 to help us there. And there is a feeling that more can be done to reform that. But the way to do that is what we did uh, as Dominic said, 10 or so years ago, when, when Ken Clark, then Lord Chancellor, worked with other countries to create a, a declaration that improved at that time the way the court was working uh, and its efficiency, um, amongst other things. I think that that multilateral approach is what the United Kingdom should be taking, whilst at the same time uh, taking entirely respectable uh, uh, reforms supported by the Gross Report to update the Human Rights Act, to clarify uh, the court's role and the way in which it uh, looks at and takes into account the jurisprudence of Strasbourg, and generally make sure that an act that is now uh, 24 years old, brought into force in 2000, is fit for purpose. And that sort of incremental change was what I did with judicial review when I was Lord Chancellor. And I think that, frankly, is a much more conservative way of bringing forward change than this extremely uh, surprising, um, on one level, radical, but on another level, explosive intervention, uh, which um, will, will not just cause problems in terms of um, Conservative MP. This week, Gordon Brown and, he, and a Labour Party commission produced a, 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 a very lengthy report within which are important and, from a Conservative point of view, concerning recommendations to incorporate socio-economic rights into our law, the right to benefits, the right to work, the right to health care, for example. Now, it seems to me that the Bill of Rights is, is, a, is an open door to allow uh, opposition parties and others to lay those sorts of amendments to, uh, to get them into this bill. And I don't think that any self-respecting Conservative government would want to be seen to be responsible for creating a Bill of Rights that dramatically widens the scope of rights in a way that the European Convention doesn't contain because the convention is a convention of fundamental human rights and freedoms, not a convention that contains socioeconomic rights. And I think that distinction as well is very important to remember here. And it's, I think it's an important lesson for Conservative MPs to take on board before they uh, march through the lobbies in support of this worrying bill. And Dominic, the current Lord Chancellor has insisted that this is going to be an evolutionary change rather than a revolutionary one, and the, the UK will remain inside the convention. How do you see these proposed reforms sitting alongside the UK's relationship with the European Convention on Human Rights? How, how might that change evolutionary? I think it's going to be damaging because it must carry with it the implication that 
it is fettering the decisions of our own courts to decide cases in accordance with the text of the convention as it has been generally interpreted. Now, don't misunderstand this. Uh, in fact, our courts can disagree with the Strasbourg court if they want to, and they have done on a number of occasions, sometimes very successfully, persuading the Strasbourg court that they, the interpretation they've placed on, on something is mistaken. And we have therefore contributed to the evolution of the jurisprudence of, of, the, uh, of the convention, both here and at Strasbourg as well. But once you start telling our own domestic courts that they have to decide cases in particular ways, you're going to start to have problems. Firstly, I'm pretty sure the judiciary will try to wriggle around that. And in some cases, some of the interpretations that the Lord Chancellor wants to place on the convention, I think are irrational. And it's very difficult to see what real difference they're going to make. But insofar as it's successful in doing this, you will get more appeals to Strasbourg. And Strasbourg will have to say, well, we're very sorry, but the way in which the UK courts is interpreting this is at variance with what is accepted practice. So it's going to create a tension. And whereas at the moment the United Kingdom is seen as what I would call a really positive contributor to the development of human rights, respected judiciary, our courts listen to, the capacity to influence uh, the development of the convention, both for our own good, but also for that of other countries' uh, jurisprudence. Um, we are at risk of just isolating ourselves and our partners will look at us and say, what on earth is going on in the UK? Why are they behaving like this? And why are they laying down these strange rules by which the government seems to be trying to control how the convention is being interpreted? That is going to do our soft power no good at all. I, just to take one small example. Um, when I was Attorney General, we had the case of Abu Qatada. Now, I remember that deporting Abu Qatada was a very big problem. Uh, the press were angry about it. Uh, the then Home Secretary, Theresa May, was understandably frustrated. But we stuck to the rules, including the fact that the Court of the, um, the, the, uh, the European Court of Human Rights had said that uh, he shouldn't be deported uh, and had given interim measures in the case. We never put him on a plane to Jordan. And the consequence at the end of it was that uh, actually we changed the Jordanian Criminal Justice Code in a way that was regarded as being really beneficial. Now, under the new rules that he's bringing in, interim measures of the Court of Human Rights are to be disregarded. Um, and cannot be applied in this country, which actually is a flagrant violation of our international treaty obligation, which is that we will respect interim measures of the Court of Human Rights. So all that advantage is going to be lost. And are we going to gain anything from it? I don't think so. Robert, I'm curious to pick on the point that you were talking about before. I want to understand whether or not you feel as though the bill as a whole on principle isn't the right approach or whether the reforms that have been suggested actually could be tweaked, uh, amended by colleagues on your benches or potentially suggested amendments by the Labour Party. What do you think are the kind of changes to the Bill of Rights in its current form, which we've seen, but we're still waiting on the final date for second reading form that we might see in the future? Well, ideally, I think the bill should be withdrawn and recast. And that was the aim of the Liz Trust government, to bring back a, a measured set of reforms, narrow in scope, that would have fulfilled the obligation under the manifesto commitment and of course then would have meant that the way in which the house of lords approached the bill would have been very different bound as they are by the salisbury addison convention about manifesto commitments um, if the government is not minded to do that and to press ahead with second reading a lot of us will say well in principle some reform is necessary but the meat of it, I think, will come at committee stage. It seems to me as a constitutional bill, it needs to be heard on the floor of the House of Commons. And frankly, uh, you know, the first task is to see what can be removed from the bill. I mean, without going into morbid detail, I mean, clause one is the most extraordinary piece of drafting. And I feel sorry for the drafts men and women who were asked to do this. It looks more like an explanatory note to a bill than it does any legislation that I've ever seen before. 
Um, so, for example, that objectionable clause should be removed. There are other whole parts of the bill that seem to me to have no effect whatsoever. The provisions on deportation don't make any sense to me. They don't bite on anything that is actually contentious when it comes to the process, which is where the issues are. And the extraterritorial jurisdiction provisions, again, seem to bite on nothing. I think it's the duty of parliamentarians to cut out the um, meaningless and to focus on the meaningful and to make sure that that bill, uh, if it gets and when it gets to the Lords, is in uh, a much tighter and uh, a much more appropriate uh, condition. I mean, I, I can't speak for the Lords. I'm pretty sure that there it will get an absolute mauling to be at absolutely blunt about it. Uh, and um, you know, I'm afraid the government has got far more important things and better things to be doing with its time than uh, following up um, what is a solution in search of a problem. Because Dominic's point is fundamentally right. The, the issues that give rise to this um, cause for a Bill of Rights uh, have long ago uh, been settled. We're in a different era when it comes to our relations with Strasbourg. Um, and the danger, I think, now is uh, not just to the reputation of Britain's uh, rule of law um, image, but also the potential for investment into our country. We need, at this time of economic uh, difficulty, to be as attractive as possible to uh, legitimate investors from around the world. And they look to our legal system and its reputation as a badge of safety when it comes to those investments. And I think that there is a strong economic case to be made against wholesale change such as the one being proposed. Thank you. And Dominic, I'm particularly interested in the criticisms raised by the media about the way this bill could potentially affect free speech and the right to protest. Are those some of the sort of reforms that you're concerned about? And what are the other kind of changes that you'd like to see the government adopt to be able to make something like this bill, or at least uh, updates to the Human Rights Act, more palatable to people like yourselves? I must say, I just, I have to be blunt about it. I wouldn't go down this road at all. Uh, if you want to introduce new protections for uh, civil liberties, uh, I would do separate legislation. I would leave the Human Rights Act as it is. As I say, it's not perfect. Nothing that human beings do are perfect, but actually it is settled down into being a good working document that links us in to an international network of countries that want to maintain values and standards of human rights, does not impinge adversely on our sovereign freedom of action, and where we are making a really positive contribution to its development. Now, we ought to be proud of that. We ought to say, we've been through a bit of a rocky period, but we got through that. And there are further reforms, I have no doubt, that we will be able to bring about down the track. Robert, Robert mentioned about overseas military operations, but the court's already moved on that. And I rather agree with him that um, the court's dabbling in an area where international humanitarian law previously applied was not really enormously constructive. Uh, but they they backed off. They've begun to realize. So all these things, I just leave it alone. So uh, I'd be clear about this. If I were a par in Parliament, I'd vote against this bill at second reading and say this is completely unnecessary. If you want to bring in certain reforms in particular areas, let's look at them separately. Um, as for the offer, you know, there are some funny tidbits like protection of right to trial by jury, but I'm not really sure that that is uh, particularly uh, important. Uh, there is a section on freedom of expression, which I have to say, and I don't know about Robert's view, but looking at it as a lawyer, I don't think it makes a blind bit of difference. Uh, I, I cannot see how the change to the wording is actually going to change the way the judges balance freedom of expression, which they take very seriously against the right to privacy. I know the press have been going at this issue and have been worried about it and worried about the development of privacy law, but I don't think the balance on privacy law at the moment is wrong at all. People are entitled to a degree of privacy. Um, the changes that have come about, for example, uh, by which you can no longer have a press cohort watching a raid being carried out on somebody's house at six o'clock in the morning, uh, because unless they've been uh, arrested and charged, it's not a, it, their privacy ought to be respected. I, I don't think those are bad developments. I really don't. Um, and in any case, that can be dealt with separately. Leave the Bill of Rights 
or leave the Human Rights Act uh, to itself. And, and uh, I wouldn't do anything to try to alter it. Thank you both. We've had a good look sort of under the bonnet at the specifics of the policy that's being proposed here. I want to turn a little bit more to the politics. Robert, you were touching on it before with the concerns about whether or not the scope of this bill would leave it open to significant challenge by the Lords because it could be argued that it was, a, it was going far further and beyond the 2019 manifesto commitment. Why do you think Rishi Sunak has brought back an idea that was killed off by his predecessor Liz Truss isn't the last thing he needs now, a sort of further political headache in the Commons and the Lords as well? I'm sure it's a question he'll be asking himself and uh, people advising him in number 10, I'm sure we're giving this anxious consideration. Um, you know, I think the Prime Minister is, is a pragmatist. He's already demonstrated, I think, that he's able to listen and to adapt and to move sensibly, in my opinion, on a number of issues uh, relating to energy security, uh, for example. Um, and this is another case in point. Uh, at, a, at a time of a busy parliamentary schedule, a, a bill that was uh, due to have its second reading way back in September um, is not even you know, forthcoming uh, yet, and the parliamentary session will be over by April. Um, you know, all these questions, I'm sure, will be loom large on the mind of his advisers, and they will ask the question. You know, I love the old wartime adage about fuel economy, is your journey really necessary? Uh, I'm pretty sure that wise heads in number 10 will say, well, no, it's not. Some measure of reform, yes, but not this. Uh, and, you know, for the point about um, uh, Dominic talks about, uh, Dominic uh, Raab talks about jury trial. I mean, I've probably addressed more juries than, than any current parliamentarian. I, I absolutely believe in it. I don't see what provisions like this on jury trial add at all to the law. Uh, we've got the Juries Act of 1974. Uh, it's very clear that it's a statutory right, no, a statutory duty rather, that the state provides uh, to defendants. I just don't see what the, what the real purpose of, of a lot of these clauses is, uh, are. And I think that therefore, you know, uh, I hope that the Prime Minister will be advised that uh, we really need to cut down or, 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 or uh, withdraw the bill uh, before uh, more damage is done. Thank you. And Dominic, I'm just curious for your thoughts as somebody who has a bit more of a broader sort of outside eye. Why do you think the Prime Minister is persisting with something that has been criticised so deeply by people in his own party, by legal experts? What do you think the benefit for him is of pushing this legislation forward, considering the potential pitfalls as well? I'm not sure there is any benefit to him. I have to I have to recognise that the Prime Minister faces a pretty unenviable task and he has my sympathy. He's become leader of a party which, let's face it, has really quite serious divisions in it on some fundamental issues now. Robert, I don't, didn't expect him to comment on this, but it is obvious to an outsider that they're present. And he wants to keep the party together. And this is a topic which has undoubtedly been pushed by a section of the party and seems to have a rather strange, almost um, talismanic resonance with party members. Now, every time somebody attacked the Human Rights Act when I was in Parliament 10 years ago, it was a party conference, were huge rounds of applause from people, I have to say, who I don't think really necessarily understood how it worked. Um, so there is this sort of underlying uh, pressure. And on top of that, Dominic Raab has been, he was my former chief of staff, but he has been a key supporter of getting Rishi Sunak into Downing Street. And I'm afraid Dominic Raab uh, seems to have a bit of an obsession about this because he was talking to me about these projects when he was my chief of staff in 2008. And when I was telling him politely that really, I, you know, this wasn't the direction of travel I wanted to go in. So I think he has in part gone down this road because it appears to be the one thing that Dominic Raab wants to do. And it has some resonance with sections of the party and its membership who think it would be a good idea. I hope his advisors, I hope he'll listen to Robert. I hope he might listen to his new attorney general, um, who I would think would be a, bring a lawyer's eye to bear on these matters and might, I would be surprised, not suggest that this really doesn't stack up. Um, it would be much better to abandon this project uh, and, I would simply point this out. I remember 
this led this this whole issue led to my ceasing to be attorney general in 2014. Um, because that's why Cameron sacked me. Um, he sacked me because I told him he was planning to do something very similar to this. In fact, it's almost word for word identical. There are one or two tiny uh, differences. And I told him it was a really bad idea. And because that was an obstacle, he decided I should uh, cease to, to hold office and he wanted to put it in the 2015 Conservative Manifesto. When they actually carried out private polling for the 2015 election, they discovered to their astonishment that only 16% of people polled put it in the top 10 priorities for an incoming Conservative government. And so it was all relegated to page 96 of the Conservative Party manifesto. And then fortunately, Theresa May came in and dropped the whole thing after the referendum. Um, this, is, this is, to my mind, has no traction with the wider public whatsoever. Not, not in a significant, ele electorally significant way. Um, so I really cannot see any advantage to the Prime Minister pursuing this. And I just hope he gently takes the grab to one side and says, you've got lots of other things to do. The justice system is in, let's face it, serious crisis for a whole variety of reasons, which are a very long standing. Well, don't distract yourself by going for this project, which is likely to give very little benefit to the Conservative Party, quite apart from the fact that it's probably not a good idea. At, in fact, well, I know it's not a good idea, but I would like the Prime Minister to think it is probably not a good idea. We've had a close look then at the sort of specifics of the policy, some of the wider politics around why the government is pressing ahead with this bill. For my last question to you both, I want to turn to the sort of wider international perspective. Robert, starting with you, what do you think these reforms would do to the UK's reputation and its ability to influence sort of human rights on a, on a global stage if it's passed? I think now that uh, we've withdrawn from the European Union, I think it's more important than ever that Britain provides clear leadership within the Council of Europe, you know, we were one of its progenitors. British lawyers helped draft the original Convention on Human Rights after the war. We should be very proud of not just our heritage and our role in founding it, but frankly excited about the potential that we have to help lead uh, the future of the Council. Russia, of course, have now uh, left the Council, uh, being removed from the Council quite rightly, uh, and we have a war on, on, in Ukraine, a Council member, which is affecting the liberty and livelihood and well-being of all of us. Uh, and therefore, this time, when Britain's leadership and its uh, cooperative role in NATO and other organisations in combating the, the threat that we face and helping our friends in Ukraine has been admirable. I, I can't think of a more important stage on which we can emphasise our credentials and help lead, which is why I think the talk about withdrawal from the Convention and therefore the Council of Europe is the definition of insanity at a time when um, we are facing a threat from Putin's Russia. Do we really want to be the second nation out of the door after Russia? Uh, what an what a, a abandonment of leadership. What a, what a, what a, a denial of our, of our role in the world. And what, what, a, what a failure uh, to acknowledge the fact that you know, Britain's rule of law uh, values, its independent judiciary, its uh, quality of life are all linked. Uh, and therefore, I think it's, it, this isn't just a dry issue for lawyers. This is an issue for not just our international reputation, but our economic strength as well, which is why these things are all linked and they're deeply, deeply important. And Dominic, your final thoughts on how you think this bill would potentially detrimentally affect Britain's position overseas? The United Kingdom is going through quite a turbulent period at the moment. I go overseas a lot, um, and I have to say that our reputation, largely the result of the turbulence caused by Brexit, threats to breach international law uh, in the Internal Markets Bill, and again with the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, are all really damaging to our status. Uh, we are seen as not being quite the sort of settled rule of law state reliable partner that we were 10 years ago. 
and we should be worried about that. Actually, our adherence to the European Convention on Human Rights is an important pillar in our status internationally. And it's well regarded and our contribution is valued. Now that is what we're going to jeopardize with this legislation. And if it goes through, then I think the consequences will jeopardize at that status. And at a time when, frankly, I think we need all the friends that we can uh, get in terms of building our influence internationally, uh, losing that trust on this issue where we seem to be a leading country ever since the convention was created uh, after the Second World War, I think that will be reputationally very damaging. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I feel so passionately that this is a mistaken project and we should just drop it. Thank you both so much for your time today and talking us through what's obviously proved a controversial piece of legislation. No doubt people will be keenly watching when it comes back for its second reading in the Commons and the future battles shaping up in Parliament. Massive thanks to uh, Robert Buckland and Dominic Grieve for talking us through their thoughts there. From the Council to the Commons, Chamber publishes and broadcasts political insights and analysis from around the UK. So you can join this conversation and more by following us on Twitter at Chamber Voice. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>